Chief Hubert Ogunde, showman extraordinary and father, or Baba, as we say, of the Nigerian popular traveling theater. I write the story of what is happening in the society. That's how I believe it. It may be social, may be religious, may be folkloric, and maybe political if you like. But to me, the theater is to reflect the image of the society in which we live. In this society of ours, it is no surprising that nowadays, Ogunde is right in place which bring traditional ideas face to face with modern life. Take out of Quintinia. This is a story about a king who has remained for many years without an heir. Now he calls on the priestess to help him. His two senior wives are jealous of the new young wife, the sweet-natured Efutajo, who the king has recently married. Forced to do a servant's work, she is told to fetch water so the more senior wife can take her bath. In fact, they want to get rid of her so they can have for themselves the special fertility medicine prepared by the priestess. Later, the king calls his wives to him. Their cruel plots to make her lose her baby haven't failed. The two senior wives have one last idea. At the moment of birth, the other wives take away her baby and without her realizing it, put something else in its place.
So the people, terrified by this bad omen, this sign of the gods' displeasure, decide that poor Efutaju must be banished to the forest to die. It's the familiar folk tales of his people that Ogunde takes into his theater. They grow out of Ogunde's own village background. Here, masked performers, or masqueraders as they are called, entertain. They dance and sing stories about the triumph of good over evil, of life over death. They give dramatic meaning to people's everyday lives. Here in the village, everybody joins in. This meant that when Ogunde established his professional traveling theater, there were certain things people found difficult to accept. Then you can imagine what it would be to tell people to pay two shillings and one shilling to go and see a spectacle. It, to them, you don't need to go and pay to see a show because the masqueraders dance in the streets free of charge. That was our traditional show. And so for somebody to close the door of a room and stand at the gate and say people should pay money was something they could not imagine. But gradually, those who did come to see the show went back to tell the people oh, it was a good show and they were coming and coming and coming. No Nigerian is prepared to just sit and watch a show. Our audience may be a bit different from um, the white audiences I've seen, in that our audience will really talk back to you. They'll speak to you. They will even say some words for you to say back to them. And so you can know the way they are going. Unlike um, in Europe or in Britain, where people just sit down quietly like that, and watch. Here, we are part, the audiences are part of the show. He relates to people. Um, they love him for that. He tries, he does identify with them, not only, he doesn't try, he does identify with them. Ogunde's biographer, Mrs. Ebun Clark, lecturer in English at the University of Lagos. And uh, you try riding with Ogunde in his car. It's a very dangerous pastime because all the public is shouting, Ogunde, Ogunde, and he's acknowledging them right, and he's acknowledging them on the left-hand side. And I have to tell him, look at the road, you know. He's popular because he's simple. A man without any pretensions whatsoever. Chief Ogunde is a traditionalist. And like most traditional Africans, he has a large family. His inseparable partner in caring for that family is his senior wife, Ibisomi, who takes responsibility for the household and seeing that the other wives, the children, the grandchildren, everyone contributes both to the family's domestic and professional life. For many years, they have lived in a large, comfortable house in the suburb of Lagos, Nigeria's capital. The household is a community where the women have both influence and power, especially economic power, a community with relationships more subtle than the impression given in the press when Ogunde and his theatre visited Britain in 1969. Traditionally, Africans don't count the number of their wives. We know we have wives, there may be five, maybe 10. My grandfather had more than 20. So, but usually it's a, a secret to the household. But I would just tell you that they are more than 10. That's what I would tell you. <laughs> and uh, children too, it's even forbidden to count. Yeah, it's here, you are not allowed, I mean, by tradition to say, I have four children, or I have 15 children, 
or I have 20 children. You just say, I have children. It works better than the white man's arrangement because um, here it's a community. This house, for instance, is a community. I'm the head. These are the women. These are the children. We all have everything in common. The work I do is the work that they do too. And so when you have many hands working, many hearts devoted towards one particular goal, you know, it's much better. Two heads are better than one, they say. And so I think when there are many hearts and heads wishing something to be good, I think it would be better than only one man thinking about it. And in this community, um, there are some petty jealousies, but they are not as pronounced as to damage anything. If there's a quarrel now, it is settled. And um, people live together like brothers and sisters. It's a thing that I think I, I like very much. This is our life. Ibisomi, or Madame, as she is called, apart from being his senior wife, is his most important frontline actress. In fact, most of his wives and daughters act or help in the management of the company. Keeping it in the family makes good business sense for Gunde. It's not possible to make an audition for a wife before you marry her anyway. <laughs> and so you cannot say, I want to marry you, come, I do an audition for you, no. I marry my wives before ever they come into the theater, before I bring them onto the stage. But I know usually I don't marry any woman in Lagos. The conventional idea is that the Lagos woman is fast and sophisticated, a go-go girl, as we say. It's also the way we see those young girls who have been to the more distant big cities like London and New York. Ogunde's comedy, Londoners Return, satirizes the conflict of custom that can grow out of this. When he meets a more senior or older person, Ogunde himself, a chief, will always prostrate. But it is not just respect for the old style courtesies and customs that he considers when taking a wife. My uh, custom is to go back to my village or to a very nearby village where I know dancing, drumming is part of our lives. And so you rarely would get a lady or a girl from that side who cannot dance and perform. When they were young, they would be telling stories uh, by moonlight, dancing, clapping hands, singing. And so I've never got one that um, would be useless on the stage. Ogunde was born in the village of Ososa, near Ijebode, in the Yoruba-speaking western part of Nigeria. It was a time when, even here in Ijebu land, the conflicts between the missionaries and the traditional priest had long been resolved. My grandfather was uh, an Ifa priest. My grandmother, too, was an idol worshipper. And uh, in our house, we have several idols, the Ifa, Shango and all these. And as a result, there were uh, ceremonial, uh, I would say there are ritual ceremonies taking place every day. So being born into all these drumming, dancing, incantations, and um, all these ritual ceremonies, I think might have had uh, some influence on me. My father 
was a, a Baptist missionary. In fact, he became a pastor. He was a churchman, an organist, and uh, a good disciplinarian. And so I think um, I might have been influenced by both. Christianity, we go to God through Jesus Christ. And uh, in traditional religion, we go to God maybe through Ogun, or through Shogo, or through Obatala, or through whatever the messenger of God. Often, the priest in traditional religion will also be a herbalist or medicine man. In the Yoruba language, he's called Babalawo. Babalawo divines. The, it's an oracle. They have a system of divination. I would say a Babalawo predicting is just like uh, the astrologer uh, casting his horoscope. If you, maybe our belief, I don't know, but they always come true. If it is not true, it couldn't have been in our life for so long. People could have got fed up and say, well, Babalawos are not speaking the truth, so we don't go there. And if I bring all these together, I would say I'm a Christian, I'm also a traditional religious man. I believe in what we can say, the African philosophy, which is um, it's the same thing in Christianity, do unto others as you wish them to do to you. That is my belief. Here, 62 years ago, I was born. Here was the place that my grandfather, the old man who was a Anifa priest, here was the place he used to sit and divine. People from all over Nigeria come here to divine. From 50 miles, 100 miles, even 200 miles, they come here and divine. And he would sit here, and I would be sitting right there and then the people who come for divination would be sitting down here. It was very beautiful, very beautiful. And then this is one of the most sacred shrines or idol, I will call it, in those days. It, it has been standing for more than 100 years and it's still here. I bet it's here. It was right here. Yes. And um, I think my grandfather must have um, erected this one here say, more than 100 years ago. And I think it's still going to stand here as long as people around here live, because it will never lie down, never allowed to lie down. It will be standing straight there unless everybody dies. And therefore, then, that's the end. <laughs> I think uh, Osasa today compared with uh, Osasa of my youthful days, is a big difference. Those days, there were not as many houses as we have now. But to me, it appears that there was peace. Everything was cool, fine, beautiful. But now, nobody cares. Now, everybody in a hurry, money. Elderly people now, they think, um, they even say the world is going to an end from the point of view of the moral decay that they find now. They call it moral decay. 
but to the modern boy or girl, it is um, life. But to us, it is not life at all. One should know where he or she is going. There should be uh, a sort of discipline. In the village, the father disciplines the child, or the mother disciplines the child. Here now, people say they take freedom from the white man. Freedom that allows every boy or girl to do whatever he or she likes. We don't, we, we, people of my age don't like that. We, we believe that children are like strangers in this world. We come here before them. So we should show them where to go, where not to go, where danger is, where there's no danger. But to allow a stranger just to drift about in a new place is not very good. Ogunde's own childhood was a secure and happy one, and he has always kept contact with Ososa, his home. In the same way, too, he has always remained accessible, a man of the people. As he sees himself, he had never had much of a formal education. He attended the village school up to standard six, the equivalent of finishing primary school in England. And I think I thank God today that I didn't go to that college or university at all. Because um, I could have possibly been exposed to some classical way of life or some classical way of doing drama that I could not have been able to do what I'm doing today. His theatre performs in either Yoruba or when he's outside the Yoruba speaking area, Pidgin English. I did for backyard. Listen, today is my working day. Yes, sir. Stand here. Okay, sir. If you see anybody going like this, yes, sir. All like this, yes, sir. Just break out. Stop. Okay. Here, are two of his actors rehearse Highway Eagle, the story of a roadside thief who, in this scene, instructs his new assistant. Then you go see and say you be mad. You go be a blow. Oga, okay. if I get a blow, bruh, he said reply me, bruh, what I go do? Then you go tell him say you be proper thief. Ah. Then yeah. yeah. you go come and get a double blow. Yeah. Take it in the car, okay. Bah, 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 West African pigeon is a language in its own right, and not just English badly spoken. Oga, okay. that one, you go finish him, you go kill him, pata pata. Stop here, one, go stop proper. Stop. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Ah. Oh, madam, good evening. How are you? Fine, madam. Bye. Bye. Oh, come on, madam. Come, now come, come. waiting. It be like, say, I know you somewhere. Me? Yes. Uh, where? Not be Jankara with Jankara. Now, Jankara. Nah, Jankara. Not you, they sell clothes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You? Yeah, yeah, you know, I know me. You. You know? I know. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, madam. Now, mosquito, now, nah, mosquito. they bite somebody? Now, nah, mosquito. Now, nah, nah, so you plenty for them. There's plenty here. Now ah. clothes are they sell for your father. Yeah. Now clothes are they sell. Yes. Which one you want buy? Now Ankara. Ankara. Lace. Lace. The mask. Nah. Anything you have. I so you buy. get money. I yeah. get money. Yeah. Only yeah. for my pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what's in the fall oh, for my body? Oh, the mosquito. Sorry, oh. Ah. All my money don't fall down. Oh. Ah, sorry, oh. Ah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All my money don't fall down. Ah. Ah, they go, ah, they go. Yeah, go. OK, let's go. What is it? Yeah, Who be this man? You be you. Yeah. You know him? I don't know him. Who are you? They tell you so this place be road. This this place be your house. Go back, go back, go back. Rehearsal of the police station scene in Highway Eagle. Why? Why? Look at you. Look Policemen you often turn up in Ogunde's place, not least because after being a teacher for a short period, Ogunde became a policeman himself. I joined the police force by accident. I was on holidays from Ijebu, and I went to Ibadan. Then I was just going on the streets one day, and I saw a crowd of people, many people were standing. Oh, I inquired, what were they doing there? They said um, policemen were being recruited. Oh, then I said, policemen, I like it. Then I joined the queue. Again, go back again. About 10 minutes later, the superintendent of police came out and said, line up, line up, line up, line up, and we lined up. We were about over 400 of us on parade. And so the, the superintendent came round, 
looked round and then picked 40 of us out of 400. Then we sat to an examination and four of us were selected. That was how I joined the police force. While in the police, Ogunde started to write religious operas and plays for various churches. He became much in demand and in 1945 decided to turn professional. The whole money I got when I was starting was um, nine pounds. That was my saving for eight years in the police force. So I, out of these nine pounds, I bought raffia, bought drums, bought a small bicycle for one pound ten and some costumes and I started. He put out an advert in the uh, press asking for 30 charming ladies as actresses. 30, can you imagine a, a new theater asking for 30 women? And uh, he got no response whatsoever. Then I put in another advertisement, uh, wanted 30 lady clerks as um, workers, Ogunde, what was it then, African Music Research Party. And then the response was tremendous. Many people came, many girls came, even boys came. When they arrived for uh, interviews, he then told them that he wanted them for, uh, you know, as actresses, so that most of them ran away. And uh, some were removed by irated parents who didn't want their girls appearing on the stage and being considered as prostitutes, which they were in those days, not so much now. Ogunde in the recording studio in Lagos, laying down tracks for his latest single. Ogunde's theatre has prospered since those early days in the 40s, and others have followed this path. Most of them, like Ogunde, have been writer-actor managers, Giants in their own right. Men like the late Kola Ogumola, the late Duro Ladipo, Moses Olaya, and Oyin Adejobi. Forty years ago, there was no professional theater in Nigeria in the strict sense of the word. Today, there are over 30 struggling traveling companies in just the Yoruba speaking area of Nigeria alone. During those years, Ogunde's own company has constantly adapted and changed its style and subject matter. In the late 40s, for instance, the young Ogunde was influenced by the nationalism of such men as Dr. Namdi Azikwe, later to be Nigeria's first president, and Chief Obafemi Awolowo. He started to write plays that reflected the new political awareness of his time. They were really created specifically to imbibe cultural pride into the Nigerian public. Cultural pride so that they would be conscious to realize that colonial rule was, uh, continuing colonial rule was not good. In fact, when he took his play, Strike and Hunger, to the tin mining town of Jos, the colonial authorities reacted. And when the play started, Police came on the stage and scattered the uh, you know, uh, actors and actresses and scattered the audience and arrested Ogunde and a few of his artists as well. And of course, the nationalist press notified the whole country immediately with screeching headlines. It became a hot public debate for days. You know, their darling had been captured by these very cruel people, you know, by these colonial masters. <laughs> and this, of course, helped Ogunde immensely. Independence came in 1960, but Ogunde's clashes with the authorities didn't finish with the end of the colonial era. He continued to be critical of the new African rulers. In 64, he wrote a play called Yoruba Ronu, meaning Yoruba Think. Although set in ancient times, it was in fact a bitter comment on the then current struggle between two Nigerian politicians competing for power. Chief Obafemi Awolowo and his protégé, Chief S.L. Akitola. They invited him to write a play for the inauguration of the cultural arm of their party. And he agreed. And when he put on the play, they thought he was going to show a nice cultural show on Yoruba custom. And he started attacking them. It's stories of a king who, leaving his vice regent temporarily in charge of his court, travels throughout his kingdom. 
But the vice regent, having been given power, has no intention of giving it up. The king is taken captive, and corruption and poverty come to his land. His bewildered subjects are left to suffer. Eventually, the gods intervene, and the king is restored to his rightful place. The prime premier and the ministers realized that he was attacking them, and they all got up and walked out. And he continued with the play, and it was immensely enjoyed by the public and the audience. And a few days later, he was banned. This time, he did not go to press. It was the press that protested on his behalf. This banning order lasted right up to Nigeria's first military coup two years later. But before then, in the 50s, Ogunde had developed what was later to be called his concert party style. Again, he was responding to the people's changing mood. They wanted a theater that concentrated a lot on jazz and uh, Western variety, you know, shows. And he had been doing this in Ghana, having his women playing the saxophone and dressed in grass skirt and big hats and really shaking their you know, figure. Uh, it was a theater that really oozes, oozed with sex appeal, which was not so in his theater of the 40s. <laughs> He put onto the stage a collection of contemporary rogues, bomber boys and good time girls, talking hip and local pigeon, reflecting the easygoing morals of the new city life. Hey, which business do you crack now? Hey, you mean me? No. Hey, I'm importer and exporter. Hey, I don't get beer, but I supply them beer. Of course. That is ticky change. Ticky change. But in the 60s, Ogunde changed direction again. The West was moving in fast. Nigerians wanted to remember and record the old ways before they were changed beyond recognition. So we return to Arokmin Tenia, written in 1964. The sad tale of the poor Efutajo, condemned to exile in the forest for having given birth to a stone. We take up the story many years later, when a strange young boy is found by the river and brought to the king's palace. Already, he has told them that his name is Uriadeki Be, meaning in Yoruba, the one born to be king. Shortly after, the king summons his people to the palace. The king's chamberlain insists that everyone should come, even poor Efotajo, who is brought in from the forest by two hunters. She is so changed that people don't even recognize her. The old priestess explains the king's plan. The plan is for all the women to prepare with their own hands a stew. They will offer it to Oriade Kigbe. It is hoped that through this, he will come to know his proper mother. Uh -huh. 
Eventually, it seems Oriadeki Igbe has been shown everyone. The priestess asks him to take just one final look. So there it is. The righteous have come out on top. The wicked are to be punished. While the two elder wives are led away, Efutajo, now based and freshly dressed, returns to sing of how, with patience and honesty, we can overcome our misfortunes. A sentiment close to Ogunde's heart. In any venture, there must be problems. There must, be, there must be difficulties, and then one has to persevere in spite of uh, all odds. I think uh, this has been the reason why I have been able to be successful up to this point. Because in my life, I never, problems don't set me back. When I meet any problems, what I do is to just ignore it and push forward. Apart from Ibisami, the other person most important to Ogunde's work was Adeshiwa, or Madame Eko, as she will always be remembered by Nigerian audiences. The beautiful girl who left her studies to follow Ogunde and the life of the traveling theater. I think it's the saddest thing that has ever happened to me in my whole career as a dramatist, because uh, she was a frontline woman. She was always with me. And um, she was really very good. But unfortunately, we were to go to uh, Elisha to perform, and they were going ahead of me. And the lorry in which they were traveling had an accident, and she died. People even thought I wouldn't be able to survive it. They thought I wouldn't be able to continue. But um, after a few days, I thought she was gone, she was gone. And so, and I have a goal. I have a mission to fulfill. If the death of this madame could stop the whole mission, it means it was no mission at all. If it was a mission and a career, nothing should stop me. So I continued. <laughs> Today, in spite of his success and national popularity, Ogunde's theatre still operates as it's always done. It's never had a subsidy or government grant. It survived, as indeed do all the other travelling companies, on its simple ability to pull a crowd. <laughs> Emma Bombay, 
Hotel Fontia. Now I'm going to make Hotel Fontia. Ogunde deliberately keeps his operation simple. In a country where things have a habit of breaking down, he believes in being self-sufficient, even to carry in his own generator for lighting, and sometimes even his own stage. As those who have seen him in rehearsal will know, he doesn't allow anything to upset him. I've never seen him lose his temper. I suppose he must do, but I've never seen it. He's always extremely patient. Very friendly. This is how I think he disarms the Nigerians. We are quite an aggressive race as a whole. And he has his own personal style of not being aggressive. And even during the pressure of rehearsals, he's still extremely calm and relaxed. When it comes to business, it's as hard as steel. I think, in my own opinion, a good artist is not a good businessman. I think both don't go together. If you're an artist, you can't be a good businessman. A businessman has to go this way. An artist goes straight. And so I cannot call myself a good businessman. He's a very, very good businessman, a shrewd one. Uh, he's a good Ijebu man. All Ijebu men are known to be good businessmen. <laughs> And um, he shows this in his dealing with uh, customers, like the National Theatre. The National Theatre was the venue for Ogunde's first feature film, the recently made Aye. After it had been running a fortnight, Ogunde had a disagreement with the management on his percentage of the take. So he went into the projection box and removed his film. As a result, there was a riot in the theatre. He always insists on controlling his box office. He will not allow any outsiders to do so and he then will hand the management cut to them, not the other way around. But Dagri, the old coastal trading port and one-time slave market, where tonight, Ogunde is showing Aye in the local open-air cinema. Ogunde doesn't sit down at home and say, the theater halls are managing my films very well. He's too aware of uh, Nigerian management to leave his management of his art to anybody but himself. He takes complete control. My film is in 35 millimeter, and so I bought a portable projector. So when I was traveling abroad, I took two of my wives with me, and they learned how to operate uh, the projector. So when I came back, I usually, I mean, going to show a film somewhere, maybe at the cinema house, or in a school hall, or even in a town hall, then my wife will be there, my daughter will be there, they set up the projector, and the senior wives uh, stand at the gate, collect uh, gate fees, and people go in and we exhibit. By that, I've been able to avoid the cheating by the cinema houses. And this isn't small money we are talking about. Oil-rich Nigeria has its own inflation, and a cinema seat costs about two pounds. <laughs> But the Ogunde organization expects a return from other sources too. The family is there in force. Apart from managing the sale of soft drinks and refreshments, there are also Ogunde's latest recordings. Aye is a film that has already recovered 50% of its production cost in the capital city of Lagos alone. Now the rest of Nigeria is anxious to see it. In a country of 90 million people, Ogunde has every reason to feel confident of its success. Aye is another traditional tale about witches and possession, divination and exorcism. I think my stories are for my people, and uh, my films too are for my people mainly. Then, if anybody wants to see it abroad, then I can export to them.
For Chief Ogunde, a year is a test of whether at the age of 62, he can start a new career as a filmmaker. The traditional African belief is that when you are to do something, you are to, when you have a mission to fulfill in this world, and you are the real man sent to fulfill this mission, your assistance will be provided to by Providence. We, we Africans say, when you meet a wife and um, you, you marry her and you live long and there was no problem or there were problems, you are able to solve them, we think everything has been prearranged by God. So I now know that because of what I'm to do in this life, my wives and my children have been specially provided to be my assistants. He's also very conscious, he's also very caring about his society and about his country. And he feels that even if Nigeria is fast changing in its uh, mood and its tastes, that he can still be the spokesman for his people.